So hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our weekly seminar. Uh, today's speaker is uh, Raniere Menezes. Um, so let me introduce our speaker very briefly. So Raniere got his uh, bachelor's in physics at the Federal University of uh, Pernambuco and his master's and PhD in astronomy at the University of Sao Paulo. Uh, from uh, 2019 to 2020, he was a visiting PhD at uh, both the University of Turin and uh, uh, at Harvard. And then in 2021, his PhD thesis was listed as one of the best PhD theses of the years by, by the Brazilian Ministry of Education. Uh, nowadays, uh, uh, Ranieri is a postdoc fellow at the University of Turin. And uh, his research covers several distinct topics on uh, high energy astrophysics, such as the adronic gamma ray emission uh, from agents, the formation of compact binary system in globular cluster, and the characterization of blazars in uh, several wavelengths. So Ranieri is also uh, the developer of Easy Fermi, a tool that immensely fa facilitates the, the usage of uh, Fermilat uh, data. So thanks, uh, thank you very much for being here with us today. And now the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Carolina, for the introduction and, and also for the invitation. Uh, so today we are going to talk about globular clusters and any special how the dynamical properties of these clusters impact on the gamma ray and X-ray emission. It's typically a surprise when I give this presentation to an to a audience of astronomers that uh, globular clusters do emit gamma rays. This typically takes them by surprise because they think, okay, we have basically only stars in globular clusters. These are thermal objects. How can these thermal objects emit gamma rays? But actually, the scenario is a bit more complicated than that. And I will show that to you in the next slides. Before talking about globular clusters, I will give you a very short introduction on the Fermi Large Area Telescope which is one of the main instruments that uh, I used in this work. So the Fermilat uh, uh, is divided in three main components, the tracker, the calorimeter, and the anti-coincidence shield. The, uh, when a gamma ray uh, enters the telescope, it interacts in one of the layers of the tracker and generates a pair of electron positron. Uh, that leaves an ionized path in this tracker, such that uh, we can uh, reconstruct the path of the electron positron and recover the incoming direction of the original photon. So the tracker is responsible for uh, the pointing, for mm -hmm. saying where the gamma ray is coming from. And uh, once uh, this pair of electron positron arrives at the bottom of the telescope, it faces the calorimeter. Here, a uh, particle shower will be developed and uh, we can uh, reconstruct the original energy of the photon in the calorimeter. And finally, the anti-coincidence shield or detector, which is this cover uh, in the telescope, as you can see here on this uh, representative figure on the left, Fermi is a telescope that uh, uh, people left uh, with the lid, so no one removed the lid to, to put Fermi in space. And this lid is exactly the anti-coincidence shield. Uh, this is a plastic scintillator, so every time that a charged particle crosses this scintillator, uh, a signal is sent uh, to the internal system of Fermi, and it, it knows that uh, the particle going down the tracker is not a gamma ray, but a cosmic ray. So this is the overview of the instrument. And this here is sort of, of an overview of uh, the capabilities and uh, the, the main results of Fermi um, in this first uh, decade of operation. So we have already more than 6,000 uh, persistent sources in the latest Fermi catalogs. Uh, and uh, 25 of them lack a counterpart in other wavelengths. And this happens because the angular resolution of Fermi is very poor 
if uh, compared to if the telescopes are uh, in other wavelengths like X-rays, optical, uh, infrared. And this is because Fermi cannot zoom in. Uh, it, uh, uh, gamma ray telescopes cannot zoom in. So they can only point the direction of the incoming photons. 60% uh, of the sources detected by Fermi are associated with blazers. We have uh, almost 200 uh, non-blazer AGNs also detected. And we have several other classes that appear in uh, uh, smaller quantities like pulsars, supernova remnants, pulsar wind nebulas, and of course, globular clusters. In this map of the sky, this is a all sky map that we did in Sao Paulo using 12 years of uh, Fermi data. And we sliced uh, the, the photons in this image uh, in different energy ranges. So from 100 MeV up to one giga electron volt, we give these photons the color red. From one giga electron volt up to 10 uh, giga electron volt, we give the green color. And above 10 giga electron volt, we, we give the blue color. So you see that the gamma ray sky has a lot of colors, like uh, uh, these blue points here are all blazers. These green sources that you cannot uh, you, you cannot find green sources in optical is, is is very is very unusual. Uh, but in gamma rays, depending on how we define the colors, uh, we find these lots of green sources most of which are uh, very old pulsars, called millisecond pulsars, and some globular clusters as well. And finally, we have these uh, uh, red sources that are uh, young pulsars or uh, uh, other types of active galactic nuclei. But this is just a summary of uh, Fermi Lat. Okay, let's, uh, let's give an introduction now to globular clusters. I'll give you a lot of introduction. So Fermi, globular clusters, uh, a little bit of just a little bit of celestial mechanics, and then I arrive to to the goals and results of the of my research. Okay, so let's talk about globular clusters now. Uh, these systems are, are evolved collections of stars uh, that are bounded by gravity, and you can tell even by eye that uh, we have a high number density of stars. Uh, this density is so high that uh, for give you, giving you a, a comparison, if you take a box with uh, one cubic parsec uh, in volume and center this box in the sun, let's imagine a cubic box, center it in the sun. The sun will be the only star in this box. This is how um, this is how low is the density of uh, the numerical density of stars in the neighborhood of the solar system. So if you take the same cubic box with one cubic parsec and put in the center of a co uh, globular cluster like Messier 5 in this figure here, uh, it's very easy to find more than 1,000 stars. So we really have a, a unusually high uh, numerical density of stars. And you can imagine that in such a scenario, dynamical interactions are common, and indeed they are. Uh, most of the globular clusters are also very old. This is not mandatory, but uh, most of the globular clusters in the Milky Way, they have more than 10 billion years. Uh, and 47 to Kanai was the first globular cluster detected by LAT. And nowadays we have around 40 globular clusters listed in the Fermi catalogs. Okay, globular clusters, they, they host several compact binary systems that are formed mainly uh, in stellar flybys. At least this is uh, uh, the formation channel that we believe and they are formed. And so these stellar flybys can eventually uh, produce mass transferring binary systems, some of which are low mass X-ray binaries, LMXB represented here. And in this case, these uh, compact binaries can evolve to millisecond pulsars. And finally, the millisecond pulsars emit the gamma rays that we observe in, in globular clusters. 
So in the end, the gamma ray emission from global R clusters is actually coming from the population of millisecond pulsars that they contain. And uh, in this scheme here, we have a, a pulsar uh, with the uh, light cylinder represented here. The light cylinder is the is the limit where the core rotation of the plasma around the, neut the neutron star uh, reaches the orbital speed uh, equal to the speed of light. So this is the, the light cylinder. And uh, the most, most likely scenario for the gamma ray emission from these millisecond pulsars is that we have this acceleration of particles, uh, mainly electrons and positrons, in these magnetic gaps very close to the to the edges of the light cylinder and the expected uh, gamma ray spectrum from this emission is a power law with exponential cutoff and so uh, the gamma ray emission of a globular cluster should be the sum of the gamma ray emission of several individual pulsars and indeed this is what we see so here on the left we have uh, the gamma ray spectrum of Terzan 5. This is the, the cluster with the highest gamma ray luminosity in the Milky Way. It's not the brightest due to, to the distance, but it's the one with the highest luminosity. So we indeed see a power law with an exponential cutoff for this spectrum. Okay, I briefly mentioned a few slides ago that... Uh, Stellar encounters uh, are behind the formation of millisecond pulsars. In this work, we test if this is true. But uh, at this point, it's uh, very convenient to define a stellar encounter height, and we define it as, uh, as this quantity gamma here. So the encounter height is proportional to the integral uh, of the square of the density of stars. This is a function of the radius of the cluster. and uh, over the velocity dispersion um, of the stars in the cluster, which is also uh, a function of the radius of the cluster. And uh, once a binary system is formed after a, a close encounter, this binary system may undergo subsequent encounters that can eventually ionize or make the binary even harder. So in this work, we also investigate what is the, the role of the secondary encounter height in the binary uh, hardening or ionization. And uh, the secondary encounter height is given uh, here by lambda and depends on the density of the cluster. Uh, it's inversely proportional to the dispersion velocity of the nearby stars. And it depends on the orbital separation of the binary. So the largest, uh, the larger is the binary, uh, the larger is the probability that they, it will find um, a third star and, and have a secondary encounter. This uh, value here of orbital separation should be a problem because uh, in principle, if a binary is formed uh, by tidal capture in an encounter, uh, how, how can we know what is the orbital separation? This should be a problem, but this is not. This is not a problem because uh, uh, imagine a scenario where we have two stars coming from infinity uh, and passing uh, nearby each other. These two stars will never, never be bounded in a binary system if there's no loss of energy. And uh, in, in the scenario of, a, of the core of a globular cluster, the main uh, phenomena behind the, uh, this loss of energy are the tides. So one star uh, provokes tides in the other, and these tides uh, dissipate the, the total energy of the system. If they are high enough, these tides, uh, they can dissipate enough energy such that the final energy the final energy of the system is negative. So we have a, we have a binary system. And uh, for uh, in, in real scenarios such that uh, 
uh, an encounter can form a, a closed binary system. These encounters have to be very, very close, such that the, the tides are very high and the, there is enough energy dissipated. And uh, we know, this is a, new, a no result, that the final periastron, uh, which is the, the closest uh, point uh, of the orbit, uh, has to be among three to five stellar radii. And when I say stellar radii here, uh, is uh, st the, the radius of the main sequence star, because remember that uh, uh, the millisecond pulsars to be formed, they need uh, a neutron star. So one of the objects will be a neutron star, and the other will be a normal star or even a white dwarf. Okay. After the formation of a binary system, the orbit of the system will be very, very eccentric. So we have a low uh, periastron. However, the apoastron can be very high. However, uh, these orbits tend to circularize very fast. Uh, a binary system formed in a tidal capture uh, has typically the uh, orbital periods of a few hours. So after a few hundreds, a few thousands, uh, a few hundred thousands orbits, this, uh, these systems are, are basically uh, are quite circularized. So at the end, uh, uh, this apoastron will not be that high. So it will shrink a lot while the periastron will increase a little bit. So for for uh, facilitating the, the calculations that I will show you in the next slides, we assume a final orbital separation of 10 stellar radii, which is already much larger than this one. And this is a quite conservative uh, assumption. But OK, but the, all, all of these slides up to now were uh, an introduction. There is a little bit more of introduction, but it will be on the fly. And uh, let me present you the goals of uh, of this work. So we are trying to, we did actually uh, the spectral characterization of globular clusters. Uh, we were trying to check if the gamma ray emission was consistent with millisecond pulsars. We tested if the stellar encounters really contribute to the formation of compact binary systems in globular clusters. We test the importance of secondary encounters on the evolution of these binary systems. And uh, we also look at for extended gamma ray emission uh, from, from cosmic ray propagation within the globular clusters. These two points here actually give us, uh, these two central points actually gave us very interesting results. And um, I hope you enjoy them. But let's start from the beginning. So. Is the emission, uh, is the spectrum of uh, globular clusters consistent with millisecond pulsar? The short answer is yes. So uh, most of the clusters we model with a power law exponential cutoff, but some of them uh, are better modeled with a, a log parabola, which is still in agreement with the uh, expected spectrum of uh, millisecond pulsars, although they are not that common. So what we do here is a spectral diagram. We analyze the, the population of globular clusters investigated in this work at once in a diagram. This is almost half of the population we did. Uh, so we, we use the log parabola model. And in this slide, uh, we have the, the other half where we use the power law exponential cutoff. Uh, th these are basically the same slides, just uh, just changing the spect spectrum model. So here we have the energy peak of the spectrum as a function of the spectral index. And we see that indeed uh, uh, the globular clusters uh, in this slide show by the orange dots, they occupy a region of this diagram that is consistent uh, with millisecond pulsars. So this... Uh, this is this is important in the context uh, of the search of uh, other phenomena in globular cluster that can be behind the gamma ray emission, like for instance dark matter annihilation. 
but from the spectrum itself, from the analysis we did here, uh, these spectra are very, very consistent uh, with emission from the second pulsar. So this leaves um, less space for scenarios where we have uh, dark matter annihilation behind the gamma ray emission. Uh, and uh, the, as I briefly showed you before, so the individual SCD of uh, globular clusters typically are very well described by a uh, power law with exponential cutoff of R uh, by a log parabola. And sometimes we can even see um, things like that, like this uh, very high energy point that is possibly a stellar component uh, emitting gamma rays. And I will give you more details in the, in the final slides of this presentation. Okay, question number two. Are the stellar encounters really contributing to the formation of compact binary systems? The short answer is yes, but the, we have a long answer for this one because this, uh, this slide here uh, contains a, a lot, a lot of information. Okay, in the y-axis of this, of this plot, I'm showing you the number, the total number of X-ray sources that I found in the core of globular clusters. Each dot here represents one of the globular clusters in our sample. And then the numbers are uh, uh, above, uh, can go from a few times to, to just uh, a handful of X-ray sources. And we plot this number of X-ray sources as a function of the stellar encounter height defined here and as I detailed to you a few slides ago. So we found a linear correlation. Uh, so the higher is the number of stellar encounters, the higher is the number of X-ray sources that we find in the core of globular clusters. This is a linear correlation, and this is what we expect to see from the literature from the last uh, 25 years, more or less. However, for... Uh, globular clusters with very low values of uh, encounter height, we found this unexpected rise in the number of X-ray sources. This fit here was performed only for the clusters above uh, gamma equal to 100. Uh, so below 100, we have this unexpected rise. And this was the first uh, great result of this work. We we don't know how to explain that, but we gave it a try. So I tried to, to, to explain uh, uh, this high number of uh, X-ray sources here, uh, considering um, primordial binaries in these clusters that uh, shrink over time uh, via the, the Hagee Hughes law that I will detail for you a bit later. You see that there is a lot of introduction here, but, but uh, indeed I'm, uh, uh, I'm putting a lot of uh, different areas together uh, in this work. But okay, so I try to see if a primordial binary with a orbital separation uh, of one astronomical unit given here by uh, uh, D, the, this D and the Earth symbol, if these primordial binaries could shrink until becoming compact binary systems uh, in globular clusters. And uh, this uh, color bar here gives you the shrinking time for this process to happen. So for a primordial binary separated by one astronomical unit within these globular, globular clusters, the shrinkage time uh, can reach 10 to 12 uh, or 12.5 years. So it, it's definitely not the answer because uh, most of these uh, uh, time scales here are uh, uh, older than the universe itself. So uh, we do not have time in globular clusters, at, at least in the Mucway, because all of these are in the Mucway. We do not have time enough time for primordial binaries to shrink 
until becoming a compact binary system. So we didn't know what caused that. We raised this hypothesis and uh, we ourselves uh, uh, found that this hypothesis was wrong. But in any case, the result persists. So we have this unexpected rise in the number of uh, X-ray sources for clusters uh, with uh, low rates of stellar encounters. Okay, this is just to detail you how we counted the X-ray sources in the globular clusters because we cannot simply uh, point the telescope and uh, sum up everything and that's it. We have to take into account that uh, we see a lot of background uh, X-ray sources as well. So when we point to the globe, to the core of the globular clusters, there are these, the sources that are indeed in the core of the clusters and those in the background. So we use a log n log s uh, relation to subtract what we expect uh, uh, for background sources. And then we are left just with the, uh, with an estimate of the total number of X-ray sources only in the core of the globular cluster. This, uh, this plot here is exactly the same as this plot, however done in gamma rays. Instead of the number of gamma ray sources, I'm plotting here the gamma ray luminosity, because in gamma rays we cannot, uh, uh, we do not have a high enough resolution to pinpoint every single gamma ray source in the core of a globular cluster. So instead of that, I'm taking the luminosity of the cluster and plotting it against the, the stellar encounter height. Again, we see a linear correlation. Here, the index of the correlation is 1. In the previous plot, it was 1.16, so a linear correlation, at least uh, within the, the, the error bar. And here, we see a larger scatter in gamma rays. And um, I think this is because the gamma ray emission is uh, beamed while the X-ray emission is, uh, is much more uh, isotropic. So the gamma ray emission from millisecond pulsars is, is quite beamed. So we can see a lot of fluctuations depending on the beaming um, of, um, of this emission. And also for uh, in the gamma ray regime, we have less sources than in the X-rays because here I have the total number of X-ray sources. But uh, this is not uh, exactly the number of gamma ray sources. The, the number of gamma ray sources is, is smaller than that. We don't know how much smaller, but it's smaller. So we are prone to more, uh, to more fluctuations with uh, a small number of sources. And uh, uh, OK, and th this, is the, this was the result for um, uh, the gamma ray plot uh, of the luminosity and the uh, encounter height. So we, we basically find the same uh, correlation. And uh, question number three, how do secondary encounters affect the evolution of compact binary systems? And the short answer is that the secondary binaries do not ionize the systems. They actually tend to make the binaries harder and harder. And by harder, I mean more and more compact. Before going further, I have to. I will very quickly introduce you to the Hege Hughes law, which says that uh, hard binaries tend to get harder and soft binaries tend to get softer, softer in face of uh, three body three body encounters, where a hard binary is defined as a binary where the binding energy of the system is larger than the average kinetic energy of the nearby stars. And the soft binary is the opposite. So if we just uh, if we open the Hege Hughes law and play it just a little bit with the with the terms, we find that uh, a binary system will shrink if the orbital separation of the binary is smaller than this quantity here, which is the gravitational constant, the mass of the compact binary divided by the dispersion velocity of the nearby stars. And we can actually rewrite uh, this in terms of the stellar encounter rate performed binary that I presented a few slides ago. 
and uh, we end up with this quantity lambda here, uh, defined in a way that uh, if lambda is greater than one, the binaries uh, will tend to be ionized. Here I put will be ionized, but actually this is a statistical process. So they will tend to be ionized by secondary encounters. While if uh, lambda is, uh, is smaller than one, the secondary encounters will tend to make the binaries harder and harder, uh, which means they will shrink the binaries even more. So this, this, is, what, this is the second great uh, result of this work, is that uh, uh, the lambda values for all of the globular clusters uh, detected in, in, in gamma rays, all of them are in, in the mucoid, uh, for all of them, the value of lambda is very, very uh, is smaller than one, which means that the binaries for sure will not be ionized. So they will uh, strongly tend to, to shrink even, even more. And uh, actually for half of these clusters, uh, the binaries uh, at uh, an orbital separation of 10 stellar radii, uh, we, we will lose uh, more energy by gravitational waves than by the, the passage of nearby stars. And in this scenario, the binary ionization is absolutely unrealistic. This is a quite a strong result from this work. So uh, the binaries, the, the compact binary systems in the core of globular clusters, they, they cannot be ionized by, by secondary encounters. This is a very strong uh, affirmation, but this is what these results are pointing to. And um, I said that the, the secondary encounters will make the binaries harder and harder. This is true, but uh, not that much harder because the time scales involved are, are uh, really, really long. So here we have another uh, color bar for the time scales of the shrinkage due to, to the passage of uh, nearby uh, stars in a binary system. And we see again that the time scales are very, very long. And this happens because the tighter the binary gets, the higher is the time scale for the shrinkage. As you can see here, this is the time scale for the shrinkage of a binary system. And it's inversely proportional to the orbital separation A. So the smaller the A, the higher is the shrinkage time scale. This, this is the opposite for the, the gravitational wave emission. And, but in any case, both time scales are very long. This is analogous to the final parsec problem of supermassive black holes in the course of uh, uh, merging galaxies. And finally, the, the last point of this, of this presentation, uh, can we observe extended gamma ray emission from globular clusters? And the short answer is not yet. Uh, here you see that I did uh, a lot of uh, different things, uh, a lot of different analysis with the same population of globular clusters. And indeed, this was a population study and a, a, a full characterization uh, of, this, uh, of this population, especially in gamma rays, but a little bit in X-rays as well. So, okay, let's keep going. Uh, can we observe extended gamma ray emission from globular clusters? And the answer is not yet. I don't know if it will be possible in the future, but uh, we expect to see it with CTA. And okay, a, a handful of globular clusters have a half light radial, uh, radius in the optical uh, with angular sizes that are in principle measurable by Fermi LAT. Fermi has a, in the best uh, possible scenarios, have a resolution of uh, one to two arc minutes. So for a few globular clusters, the half light radius uh, is larger than that. And we could be, could in principle be able to, to resolve globular clusters with Fermi. 
but this is not the case. So you you see here in the in the right, uh, I was trying to to fit an extended template to the NGC one hundred four, which is the forty seven to can I, and uh, the TS the test statistic for extended emission is zero point thirty four, which is uh, absolutely negligible. So this cluster, which is one of the largest uh, in the sky in terms of uh, angular uh, angular size, uh, is basically a point source for Fermi. This indicates that uh, the millisecond pulsars are very concentrated in the nuclei of globular clusters. And uh, this is consistent with a scenario with the dynamical friction, the Chandrasekhar friction, uh, makes the heavier objects uh, sink to the core of the mass distribution very quickly. So this is uh, this is the supported scenario uh, if, uh, based on the Fermi data since we don't have we don't see extended emission even from the brightest uh, globular clusters in gamma rays. Uh, so we, we tested for um, these five uh, globular clusters. These are the largest in the sky uh, in terms of angular uh, angular size, but we could not find uh, a significant uh, extended emission from them. So these results are expected, uh, are sort of expected in the gamma ray band of Fermi. Fermi in principle could detect extended emission from them because Fermi can observe uh, uh, gamma rays up to one tera electron volt. However, Fermi is not the ideal instrument for observing this extended emission. Uh, we give it a try. We found nothing, but uh, uh, it was a possibility. So in the end, we found nothing. Uh, we expect a lot of uh, extended gamma ray emission from globular clusters at the very high energy domain, uh, which means above uh, a few hundreds of giga electron volts, right in the in the tail of the Fermilat uh, sensitivity capabilities. So we expect this this gamma rays to be uh, halfly isotropic. So in the Fermi band, we expect them to be beamed, while in the very high energy domain, we expect them to be isotropic and extended. Uh, because uh, we have a lot of uh, particle acceleration in the magnetospheres of millisecond pulsars. And once these particles escape the, the magnetosphere, they keep propagating inside the, the clusters uh, and they can eventually upscatter the thermal photons of the stars in the cluster to the gamma ray domain, similar to what we see with the sun. So we have something like that. We have a star in the core of the globular cluster. Uh, we have a, a very high energy electron or positron that was accelerated in, a millis in the magnetosphere of a millisecond pulsar, and it upscatter this photon to the gamma ray domain. This is exactly uh, why we see gamma ray emission coming from the halo of the sun. And uh, we also look at for a, this, this is uh, a plot uh, for the gamma, the extended gamma ray emission from superluminous stars uh, near the solar system. But in this case, we found only, only upper limits. But for the sun, we indeed have a extended halo emission. So you can see here, uh, it's given by this green component that the gamma ray emission from the halo of the sun extends up to uh, 10 to 14 degrees. So it's really, really, it's a really huge uh, source in the sky. And we expect to see this same sort of gamma ray emission coming uh, from globular clusters. However, in a much more uh, uh, extended way, such that uh, this plot here that I already showed you before, which is the correlation about the gamma ray luminosity and the stellar encounter height, 
this plot, we expect it to be much more tighter in very high energy um, gamma rays because we expect the emission to be isotropic because once these uh, particles escape, escape the magnetosphere, they have to propagate a bit randomly in the core of the globular clusters and uh, upscatter the photons in random directions. So we, we would expect this uh, correlation to be much tighter in very high energy gamma rays. Uh, probably CTA will be able to, to detect globular clusters in very high energies. Up to now, the only cluster observed uh, uh, in very high energies is Terzan 5, uh, which was detected by Hess. However, some further confirmation is needed because this emission is not centered on the cluster, has a weird shape. So we, we really need more data to that. But um, up to now, this was the only cluster uh, observed in very high energies. And uh, we still need to bridge the gap between the Fermilat observations and the and the very high energy, the, the Cherenkov telescopes that uh, we have this huge gap uh, in a few giga electron volts that Fermi is not uh, sensitive enough, uh, neither are the, the Cherenkov telescopes. So we really need to, to bridge this gap and to, to have some... To, to have better models to constrain the physics behind the, the gamma ray emission of globular clusters. And uh, uh, yeah, this is basically the same. So uh, just before concluding, I would like to advertise you of uh, Easy Fermi. This is a software that uh, I developed one year ago and that facilitates a lot, but a lot, the usage of Fermilat data. So let's say you do, you are an X-ray astronomer, you are doing the SCD of a blazer and it will be convenient for you to have gamma ray data. So you just uh, uh, install Easy Fermi and you, the, basically the only thing you need to know is the right ascension and declination of your source. Then uh, these files are, uh, you can download from the, from the, Fermi database, but they are very easy to find. Here you can define the energy range at which you want to, to compute the SCD or light curve or whatever you want, and the, the observational dates. So it's a very, very useful tool, very easy to use, and very, very powerful because uh, this uh, Easy Fermi is just a mask for Fermi Pi. So it's really using the binet likelihood analysis in the background. It's a very powerful and very uh, time saver uh, tool. You can also find the tutorials uh, on YouTube. And uh, if you really want to go into the, the, the details, you can find um, all of them in the, in the paper that I published in 2022. Uh, so this is just an example of the of the results that you can get with uh, Easy Fermi. This was a uh, uh, one year run uh, that I did uh, for the Blazer PG1553. And uh, you see that uh, very easily Easy Fermi uh, gives you an SED, a light curve, uh, or try to measure the extension. All of the results that I showed you in this work, uh, you can achieve uh, with Easy Fermi. And it also gives you the data saved in FITS files and uh, NumPy files. So if you don't like this plot here, you can do the plot by yourself because the data uh, will be saved. And uh, yes, this was just a, a little parenthesis to advertise the Fermi, and, uh, but I'm done. So in summary, we found that they stellar close encounters indeed uh, dictate the formation of X-ray and gamma ray sources for clusters with stellar encounter heights above 100. Below 100, we see this unexpected rise in the number of X-ray sources and maybe also in gamma rays, although in gamma rays it's not clear. So this is uh, one of the great uh, results of this work although we don't have an answer for this. And uh, 
another great great result of this work was that uh, the secondary encounters uh, they do not ionize. They, they, uh, it's basically impossible for them to ionize the binary systems. They actually help the compact binary systems to get harder and harder. Um, this is just a, a detail that that uh, uh, I did not, I forgot to mention du during the the previous slides. But uh, in order uh, for the ionization of these compact binaries to become realistic, the dispersion velocity of the nearby stars in the core of the clusters should be so high that they must be higher than the escape velocity of the clusters. So this is not sustainable for the cluster. So th this is actually impossible. So the binary ionization uh, from stellar encounters is impossible in globular clusters. And uh, last but not least, uh, Easy Fermi is a very powerful tool. Uh, please give it a try if you are an optical astronomer, an X-ray astronomer, radio astronomer, and uh, you think that the gamma ray data will facilitate, uh, will help in your research, you can use uh, Easy Ferm. Of course, if you are a gamma ray astronomer, it will make it uh, make your life uh, easier as well. And um, that's it. Uh, if you if you want to take a look in, at the paper, uh, I'll be very happy. And uh, of course, um, you can make me. If you have questions, please feel free to to make them. And um, that's it. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you very much. I mean, a very nice talk. So, uh, and thanks for the also for make uh, our life easier as a, uh -huh. as a radio astronomer with the easy <laughs> term. That's very interesting. I, I think I will give a try in the future. Yes. Thanks. Thank I'm very happy to to hear that. <laughs> So, any question from the audience? You can unmute yourself directly or, or raise your hand as you wish. Yeah, may I ask a question? Uh, this is Andreas. I cannot find the hand button. So, <laughs> yeah, no worry. Uh, so, um, I was very much intrigued by the rise that you see in the X-ray emission for the low gamma uh, parameter. So I was wondering uh, uh, about two things. Uh, is the number of X-ray sources calculated down to the same limiting luminosity? Because I suspect different clusters have uh, observations of different depths. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, maybe I, I skip this in this slide here. Uh, but uh, yes, uh, I set the same limit of luminosity. Okay. Okay. And and the other question is: uh, do, do, do have you checked if these clusters by chance have like higher mass, for example? Uh, is there any correlation between oh. the excess and the mass of the cluster? Yes, yes, yes. And, uh, maybe, maybe I can even share with you. I don't know if I. Uh, I mean, the mass goes in directly in the gamma parameter, but uh, it's the density that matters in the gamma parameter more than the mass. So I was wondering if uh, yes. there is any correlation with the mass. I did. I did this plot exactly this plot. So instead of uh, plotting the shrinkage uh, time okay. scale here in the colors, I plot the the mass of the cluster, and I see that uh, these clusters here in the top uh, they tend. To, to be more massive. However, I'm not convinced that, um, it, you know, it, it was not clear to me that uh, uh, these clusters here uh, were more massive than normal. You know, for instance, this cluster here, can you see the pointer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, this cluster here, this is definitely more massive than, than most of the others. But these other clusters here, they are not... Uh, uh, is exactly massive, massive clusters. They are a normal mass clusters, you know. So I was wondering if uh, this high rise here was just because the clusters had more mass, but indeed this cluster here was the only one that uh, had a significantly higher mass. If, if you want, I can I can send you the plot. I I don't know where to find it now, but. Uh, it's a matter of a few minutes, then uh, I don't know if I can send you via email. 
Okay, sure, sure. I'll be curious. Yes. And uh, maybe another question, if I may, uh, is there any correlation between the degree of the excess in the number of X-ray sources and the gamma ray uh, luminosity? I'm I'm sorry. Can I, you mean this between this plot? Yeah, I'm and, trying now to connect the gamma ray fluxes with the X-ray, the gamma ray luminosity with the uh -huh. X-ray emission. So if you take the excess of the uh, X-ray sources over the X-ray source gamma correlation, and uh, uh, if there is any connection between the excess in the number of the X-ray sources and uh, the gamma ray luminosity because it looks like here also as you go to lower gamma parameters there is an excess in the gamma ray luminosity maybe yes, i yes. imagine that but it does look like it yes um uh, as i briefly mentioned in, in x-rays it's uh it's very clear the the rise yep. in gamma rays is um it's a bit uh, harder to tell especially because of the the huge scattering uh however this is a, a check that i did not do so I did not check if uh, uh, this, uh, let, let me see, uh, tell me if uh, I interpreted it correctly what you, what you were asking. If this uh, uh, rise in X-rays, uh, let's say linearly or uh, directly correlates with a rise in the gamma, gamma rays. Exactly. Is that, uh, exactly. Yes, this is something I did not do, but uh, indeed it's something that I, I uh, it would be a pleasure to do it. Uh, yeah, that, that would be interesting. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you a lot. Good. Anybody else? If not, can I ask one more question? Yes, please. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I, I, I was a bit uh, confused about the uh, excess in the gamma ray emission from the clusters. And uh, it wasn't clear to me whether uh, th this is expected because this is due to stars or due to the millisecond pulsars. Uh, wait, wait, you mean the, the excess in the, the... the extended, the extended X ray emission? Ah, okay, 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 okay. Uh, this is actually the extended emission is actually a combination of both pulsars and the stars in the cluster. The pulsars, just because they are the engines accelerating uh, the electrons and positrons. Okay, and the stars produce the photons that For, are the, the thermal photons that are up, up scattered. Yes, and uh, the, we expect it to be extended to actually to possibly be extended because these uh, accelerated particles, they have to propagate within the, within the cluster before upscattering the thermal photons. So depending on this propagation, if they are allowed, for instance, to leave the half light radius of the globular clusters, uh, this would be already large enough. I, I mean, if scattering the photons after crossing the, high, uh, the half light radius, this would uh, be large enough for Fermi, for instance, to detect. You know, Fermi would have uh, enough resolution then. Uh, for the Cherenkov telescopes, they tend to have a better resolution than Fermi when going to very, very high energies. So maybe even better for them. Right, but, but my, my question then is, uh, th this extent should follow the distribution, the radial distribution of the millisecond pulsars. And those are more likely to be concentrated towards the center of the cluster. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 so maybe it, it, da, it wouldn't necessarily follow the half light uh, radius of the cluster. And maybe the distribution, uh, the distribution of the millisecond pulsars would be uh, more concentrated than the stellar light. Ah, I see, I see. Uh, yeah, yes, uh, uh, this is actually something to check. So, yes, indeed, if the, uh, it, indeed it will depend on the, the different concentrations of um, the millisecond pulsar distribution in the stellar light. Yes, I agree, but, uh, uh, but uh, 
this does not invalidate that uh, we we have a propagation, right? Oh yeah, no, 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 no. Of course, of course, of course. I'm just uh, I was just wondering whether uh, if you take that into account, maybe the extent of the gamma ray emission might be a bit smaller than the half light radius. As an idea, it's totally valid, but uh -huh. I was I wondering uh, in order to measure the ex the expected extent of the gamma mm -hmm. ray, uh, maybe one should model uh, the, the spatial distribution on the, of the millisecond pulsars uh, because the, the electron positron pairs should not fly too far away from where the pulsars are sitting. Yes, I, I agree. And uh, uh, maybe... But but maybe it's bet it's because uh, you are thinking on a extended emission like a disk emission. So I put in this slide here because uh, I think that this extended emission would behave much more like a two D Gaussian, as you can see here. Mm -hmm. uh, so I indeed I expect it to be much more concentrated in the core, but uh, go is smoothly decreasing with the the with the radius of the cluster, but uh, hopefully beyond the half-light radius, but uh, maybe inside. And, but I, I would expect a 2D Gaussian instead of a more uh, disk-like... Uh, oh, yeah, of course, of course. Okay, so... Um, uh... I think this was answering your question, right, Andreas? So, yep. Um, good. I think that uh, unless there is one last last question, but I don't see any hand. Okay, then uh, we can probably thanks our speaker again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.